Welcome to Mid-Century Living, your weekly nostalgia podcast about the best of technology and culture from the mid-20th century. Welcome to episode 22 of Mid-Century Living, the show where we talk all about the best of the mid-20th century and how to add vintage vibes to your modern life. We are your hosts, Gonzalo. And Jackie, thank you for joining us today. Today we're talking about the greatest kitchen range ever designed, the Frigidaire Flare. But first, Gonzalo, how was your week? Good. Short, I guess, because we had Monday technically off. Oh. Uh, Yeah, because President's Day, there were no kids. I still had to go to work, but (laughs) I sat in my classroom in the dark and planned (laughs) and graded. But anyway, I actually had a pretty cool week. And then on Wednesday, we had a, a couple of my friends from college planned like dinner thing for a handful of people from our school from our year so uh, all architects except for me well i mean i was at one point but i'm not anymore but it was a lot of fun and uh it was great to see everybody some of them i haven't seen in a very long time uh but i wanted to give out a quick shout out to a couple of them to hannah and aaron because uh they are avid listeners to uh, our podcast so yay uh, yeah hello hi listeners but it was a lot of fun and we went to um, Mary Z's. I don't know. I don't know if you remember or if you ever went there when you lived here, but it's a Mediterranean uh, restaurant and their suica. Um, it was a lot of fun. That sounds fun. Yeah. Uh, speaking of listeners of the show, we actually got a compliment and a episode suggestion from an Instagram user, Farm Weasel, who apparently also listens every week. So hi, shout out to hey. them. Um, they gave us a pretty interesting episode suggestion that we need to start researching for because I think it sounds super fun. Mm-hmm. Um, so stay tuned, listeners. Stay tuned. But anyway, that was my week. Other than that, it was very standard, regular school week. So how was yours? Uh, it was fine. Let's see. So, man, everyone is just going to get tired of my food chat. But like all of my interesting things that are happening to me lately are food chat. But it's February, which is a very celebratory month i guess because we've got valentine's day well we have valentine's day which is like a romantic food holiday and then boyfriend and i's anniversary is february 25th so i've got like two fancy dinners in a row and i'm trying Uh, to do um a no spend month so i decided to cook all of our fancy dinners at home for both of our like romantic holidays anniversaries count as romantic holidays I don't even know if that's a genre of holiday, but I decided it I, is. I, I am the least qualified to <laughs> say anything on this matter, so go ahead. So uh, since we last talked, I think I was like kind of disappointed last we chatted about how my Valentine's Day dessert didn't turn out. Um, and I decided to pivot away from baking, which is not my strength, and instead go to just cooking stuff, which I tend to be a little bit better at. So I... For Valentine's Day, I decided to make the anniversary dinner menu from Betty Crocker's Dinner for Two cookbook from 1964. And Mm -hmm. I basically, I stole her menu, but I didn't follow all of her recipes. And it was lobster tails, twice baked potatoes, rolls, a salad with tomato cucumber mayonnaise. That one I actually followed the recipe for. And mm. you're making us frown, but I love all of those things. Yeah, boyfriend didn't eat it either. I knew he wouldn't because he doesn't like cucumbers. So I made him like a wedge salad with wedge salad things on it. And I ate the tomato cucumber mayonnaise because I love mayonnaise and I'm always looking for more excuses to eat it. <laughs> and all it was is just like chopped diced tomatoes and cucumbers and mayonnaise. And I watered it down a little because it was like especially goopy, which I know does not sound appetizing. <laughs> No, it does not. <laughs> Goopy is not something that I'm looking for in my food. <laughs> well, it was delicious and a great idea if you're into mayonnaise, I guess. And then, so instead of, she recommends broiling the lobster tails, but I air fried the lobster tails. Ooh, which futuristic. It is the future, and we can do things like that. And if no, I'm sure anyone who is listening who owns an air fryer is nodding their head in agreement that it is the best kitchen appliance to hit the market in recent history. It is everything that goes into it comes out perfect. It is basically foolproof. So my friend who, remember my my ex-roommate who uh, moved into my house after issues with the apartment? Anyway, when he was moving, he threw away his air fryer. 
Like he put it next to the trash pile downstairs in the in the trash room because there's no room in my house because my kitchen's tiny. It can't live on the counter. It is huge. And that is a problem. But I have, I think I've mentioned on the show before, like a vintage kitchen cart. that Yeah, all your appliance my, cart. My appliance cart. So it lives over there. And then I like with my soda stream and my toaster and my like waffle irons, like all of that crap is on a cart. Speaking of waffle iron, um, this doesn't have to be in the show, but it can. <laughs> but speaking of waffle irons, did you know that June 26th is also National Waffle Iron Day? I did not. Yeah. That is fantastic. Why haven't I? I've been, I should have been doing birthday waffles this whole time. Yeah. Well, heck. <laughs> I know we're in, in February and June's, you know, a million years away. Yeah, I gotta do something waffly. I only have I have two waffle irons. I was gonna say I only have two waffle irons, but then I realized that <laughs> more than one is probably too many waffle irons. But neither of them are normal waffle shapes. I have pumpkin shaped ones and Mickey shaped ones. One, oh, I was gonna say it's one Disney. It sure is. But I would like a regular square waffle iron, like preferably one of the kinds where you like it makes big waffles, but that you can cut into four smaller waffles because then you can. Uh-huh. T- Toast the leftovers. I saw an advert on Instagram for a waffle iron, but what it did is it makes like Lego shapes. So then you can build with your waffles. <laughs> and I was like, you know, you shouldn't play with your food, but also you should play with your food. Yeah, that sounds like fun. <laughs> Guys, everyone out there in, in the world listening, um, I'm an adult. <laughs> <laughs> See, this is why, like, why would you want to, like, so on the one hand, it would be nice to have, like, normal adult waffles, but in a world where they have all these kind of fun novelty waffle irons, like, why waste your time on something boring when you can have Lego waffles or Mickey-shaped waffles or pumpkin-shaped waffles? I like your philosophy. Like, why life is short. At UH, in the dining halls, we had um, Texas-shaped ones, and in the center of Texas was the UH logo. Cute. Yeah. Yeah, the Texas-shaped waffles that they have at the free hotel breakfast were, like, my favorite thing about moving here. They don't do that in other states. Yeah, it's not like no if you go to New York, they have New York-shaped waffles in the kitchen. Because like, no one knows what New York looks like. It's weird shapes. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't make a very good waffle. Anyway, so that's <laughs> food chat. But I guess food chat isn't very off-topic in this episode, because we are talking about kitchen stuff. So I guess let's get on with the show. Awesome. So today we're going to talk about the Frigidaire Flare, which is the prettiest range and oven that ever exists. I was motivated to make this episode because yet another of my Instagram friends got a Frigidaire Flare. Like, it's just slowly but surely everyone I follow on Instagram is getting one of these. And I don't have one yet. And I'm salty about it. And instead, I decided to channel all of that into just lots of research. And I can share with the world how beautiful this appliance is. Is yeah. this the one that, that Samantha had? Yes. This is the, the the oven and range combo that Samantha had in the early seasons of Bewitched. Bewitched. They She redesigns her kitchen halfway through, and then they get something else. Boring. Yeah, I know. I guess a little backstory on Frigidaire, the company. So they're actually a subsidiary of Electrolux, which I feel like we've mentioned before. I don't know if um, we mentioned Electrolux. I think we're confusing it with all the other awesome names that we've had covered. Yeah, it either just sounds very mid-century or... I think we're thinking Electrobat. Oh, yeah, that's probably it, the Electrobat. Oh, well, Electro something. So uh, they were founded as Guardian Refrigerator Company in Fort Wayne, Indiana. They developed the first self-contained refrigerator. Um, it was invented by someone named Nathaniel B. Wales and someone else named Alfred Mellosine in 1916. Mellosin. I would have said Mellosin. Yeah, I have no idea how to read things. I have to have someone, <laughs> as you know, someone has to say it out loud for me to know how to pronounce it. I cannot <laughs> guess. I'm really bad with phonetics. Uh... So this brand was so well known in the refrigeration field in the early to mid 1900s that many Americans actually called any refrigerator a Frigidaire, regardless of brand. So they were one of those companies like Kleenex. Yeah. In Latin America, a lot of times Frigidaire... It's just the word for refrigerator. That's so cool. So anyway, so the company was owned by General Motors from 1919 to 1979. And that during that time that General Motors owned them, that's when the Frigidaire Flare was invented. 
Basically, the Frigidaire fr- Flare, which was first introduced in 1960 at an Ideas for Living show, um, and then introduced on the market in 1962, was a oven and range combo. But what made it so special is that the ovens are at eye level, and the doors open up and out. So instead of folding down like ovens now, where you have to like awkwardly reach around them or like get at it from the side to put things in and out of the oven, they open up. Huh. So it's easier to reach in and out. In- indeed it is. And so the, the knobs and everything are there at eye level, and the range, uh, which is an electric range, is on a drawer that you pull out and you can put back in. So that if you're not using the range, you just have counter space there. And then when you want the range, you pull the range out. Ooh, I like that, especially for like small kitchens. It's perfect for small kitchens. And so one of their main appeals, well, one, it actually sits on the countertop. So you can buy one with attached counters, but that for an additional cost. But you could also just like plop it on top of a counter that already exists. The ones that come with attached counters have like plenty of storage space in the bottom and everything. It's... Most of them, they came in two different models. There was a 40-inch double oven model and a 30-inch single oven model. And they had various levels of fanciness. The many aspects of this oven, including the mechanics of the lifting oven doors, were designed by a female named Jane v- M. Jane Van Allestein. I How would you say that? Was I right? I, I, I would say Jane Van Allestein. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I was kind of thinking. She studied ceramics at Cranbrook Academy of Art in 1941 and 1942 before going on to study industrial design at Pratt Institute and Alfred University in New York. Um, She worked for General Motors, first with GM Frigidaire and later as one of the damsels in design in the automotive division, which is pretty cool. cool. So the Frigidaire Flare was an electric range with burners that roll in and out like a drawer hidden from view when not in use. There were 30-inch single oven models and 40-inch double oven models, all 62 inches high, including a base cabinet, which had roomy storage. There were four different models in four different colors, um, or white, is how it, they phrased it in some of their other things. <laughs> I like that. Here's some colors, or white. Sound like <laughs> Henry Ford. He's like, you can have any car- color you want as long as it's black. <laughs> This description is from one of their catalogs. The special flare base cabinet. This handsome metal cabinet holds flare and all the pots and pans for an average family. Shelves slide out. Choice of four colors or white, 30 or 40 inch sizes. I love that it's like four colors or white because white isn't a color. So the oven sit right at counter height and the oven doors lift up instead of swinging out, like we said. The range itself is about six inches lower than the counter so that the tops of the pots are at a good working height. I found this other little tidbit that the practice in modern kitchen layouts of having all surfaces on a level using the 36-inch height of, of the range as the unit of measure places more emphasis on appearance than suitability. Different tasks performed in the kitchen frequently require work surfaces of different heights. You've designed stuff. What are your thoughts on that? So we're taught to design to 36 because that is when you're standing, that's the, the reach. There, we did this project in, I remember, I think second year or first year, early on in architecture, where you had to study like all the different um, like reaches that a human has by standard height. Anyway, when I worked in residential, we always designed the 36 inch throughout the kitchen because that's the standing height. In schools, 36 was the standard. However, in schools, because they're public, you have to also include um, accessibility. So we did design to a lower height, but not because of tasks to be made, but because of who is performing the tasks. So it's interesting that uh, back in the mid-century, there was some thought behind, hey, different tasks should be different heights. But eventually we stuck to the 36 inches. Yeah, and I feel like, so much good design just went away for the sake of appearances, which is so funny to say because this this thing is beautiful. It really is. It is something you want to design your whole kitchen around. Like we've joked about if we ever get an Eames, like if either of us ever buy an Eames chair, we also need to get a fancier house because uh-huh. it's just so good looking <laughs> that, <laughs> that everything around it should also be pretty. This is a beautiful oven. And I actually know one of my friends on Instagram, MC Improvement, remodeled her entire kitchen around her flare so like they got cabinets to match the cabinet that the flare came with like because they they wanted the whole kitchen to match but 
anyway, there are just like so many good ideas in this range that still make sense now, but no one does this anymore. And I don't know why, because these are just really good design ideas. So the range top is low and disappears when it's not needed. So you can pull it out to use two burners or you can pull it out all the way to use four burners. And then when it's not pulled out, that space just becomes more counter space. I, like, I like that, but also because, um, okay. The range te tends to get dirty, mm -hmm. right? So if you are cooking for people, right, and you're having guests over and you don't budget time to like clean the stovetop after cooking before they arrive, in this case, you can just hide it <laughs> and then you have your, your dinner party or guests over and then you can open it and clean it. Yep. And then that, that way you don't have to worry about that and the house looks nice. That is a very good point. I didn't even think about that. But yeah, you're right. You could totally hide the mess as well. Yeah. So uh, the controls are all at eye level, which is out of reach of children, but high enough over the pots they can easily be reached by an adult. Um, the ovens are also at eye level, so you don't have to bend down to take food in and out, baste the turkey, etc. Which is actually more annoying now that I think about it than I even realize it is because we're all just used to bending down for the oven. But like, what if you didn't have to? Yeah. And even people who have double ovens now, the top oven, you still have to open the door down which i am very short i come from a short family and it's always hysterical like watching people try to get things in and out of the oven because you have to like go in from the side especially the top oven like the door opens like right into your chest all of these things look great with the doors closed they don't i think that the design these days stops at how does it look with the door closed and they don't think about working in this kitchen you know mm -hmm. and that's what i think the frigidaire flare did is it really thought about what is what is going to be the easiest way to cook a lot of food and and they also made it pretty yeah so the oven doors opening so the ovens are at eye level and the doors pull up and out of the way so you just reach right into the oven and it's perfect listeners you may have to, we may have to like look at the instagram post with some pictures on it but the doors, when we're saying they open up, it's not like they're not hinged. So you're not like having to hold them and they're, they don't open like a garage and they don't slide up. It's like a weird combination of the doors kind of opening. Yeah, they have like <laughs> two metal arms that they like swing up on. Yeah. And but then it like cool. holds up at the top. So next in my outline, I basically, uh, I found a... 1964 electric ranges catalog from Frigidaire, which has all of the um, models of the Frigidaire flare, basically to compare and contrast. So like there are two kinds of, um, there are two like classes of the Frigidaire flare. There's the Imperial, which is the fancier version, which the main difference seems to be that the ovens are chrome on the inside and they come with a broiler automatically. Huh. Whereas the deluxe model, which is the like slightly cheaper version, I guess, has porcelain enamel interiors in their ovens. And the broiler grill, if you want that, is an optional add-on. Okay. So the there's the 40 inch, which is the double oven version, there's a 30 inch, which is a single oven oven version, and then there's the thriftiest flare of all, which has a it's a one oven with porcelain and the roll to you cooking surface. And that's it. Like it doesn't have any, it doesn't have a broiler. It doesn't have a griddle. Like some of these you can add on like a griddle on the side of the cooking of the range. You can add a rotisserie on, like you can add all these other like really cool things, but they basically, there's Imperial and Deluxe and Imperial is fancier and Deluxe is Still fancy, but porcelain instead of chrome is the big difference. There also was something called the Twin Flare, which was their version of a double oven. And it was basically... So the uh, traditional flare that everyone knows and loves is two ovens up at the top, then the drawer range, and then cabinets. This mm -hmm. one, it's a 30-inch like range thing, just like the smaller version of the flare. But it's got one oven at the top where the doors do the open thing. And mm -hmm. then instead of cabinets at the bottom, it's another oven. Oh. So and you it's, like so the, the one opening? on the top is smaller and the one on the bottom is like a bigger giant oven for the even the largest holiday turkeys. And it still has the range drawer. 
So it just means you get a second oven at the bottom instead of two ovens at the top. And I'm guessing mm -hmm. it's just so that you can have an even bigger second oven. And the also, I think it also works with it being 30 inches. So if you have, if you're tight for space, because 40 inches is fairly large for uh, an appliance. Typically in today's world, the kitchens are designed for a 36 inch appliance. Yeah. 40 might be even big. I do love also the, the name that the stovetops have. Because yeah, they, called... everything, I kind of skirted over that. Everything has cute names. So it's the roll to you cooking surface. That's what they named the like range drawer. Yeah. I they love have that. the cook master automatic oven control, which is the clock timer and automatic appliance outlet, which apparently became illegal later in the seventies. You weren't supposed to put an outlet near your range for some reason anymore. Hmm. I don't, I don't remember there being any issue with that. Cause especially with an electric range. There's the Radiant Wall Spatter-Free Broiler Grill, the Automatic Broiler Grill Control, Heat Minder, and Speed Heat Surface Units. Like, all of this is just, like, people don't name stuff like this anymore. Or maybe they do, and I just don't buy appliances enough. <laughs> Wait, you mean you don't buy a new range every year? No, I didn't even buy this one. It came with the house. <laughs> <laughs> My uh, range is a Frigidaire. Is it? Yeah. My uh, ice maker is a Frigidaire. I actually don't know what our appliances are. Anyway, so um, a history of flare models by year. Someone, so I'm gonna, I'm basically skipping ahead to all of my connection today stuff already because it just makes sense in the history of what I'm talking about. But there is a very active Facebook group called Fans of the Frigidaire Flare, which has 17,000 members. And Whoa. Honestly, if you own a flare or are thinking about purchasing one, I highly recommend joining this group, if only for the files section. They have scans of service manuals, model catalogs, parts catalogs, original cooking guides, documents explaining how to determine what year your flare is from, by the decoration on the glass and what the logo looks like on the side. It's, it's like incredible. Troubleshoot shooting tips. People can comment like, hey, this isn't working, blah, blah, blah. And there's just 17,000 people helping you out. So that's cool. Definitely join that if you're, even if you just like looking at pictures of this thing. But I, someone put together a history of the flare models by year, and I kind of took some of the highlights. So 1960 is when the flare was introduced. 1962, the Dash 2 models were introduced, and the improved, the improvements in those were they relocated the cook master to the center of the control panel cooktop. And something about the front center of the burner drawer. Apparently that was some sort of very helpful improvement. Uh, <laughs> so in 1964, the H series came out. And the person who wrote this said, best flare ever, question um, mark. That's when they restyled most of their appliance line. And it introduced several new features in conjunction with the New York World's Fair. Everyone knows about the 64 World's Fair. We should probably do a whole episode on that one day, actually. Yes. So that's when they previewed the prototype 40-inch oven featuring a microwave in the smaller oven and two 40 inch models and three 30 inch models plus three wall models. Like they were going crazy in 64. Um, they, that's when they introduced the twin one I was just talking about where they have one oven at the top and a, uh, a second oven below in a 30 inch floor space. In 1965, the J series comes out and they cut back to three models. Around this time is when self-cleaning ovens were becoming really popular and the status of owning a flare was dropping really fast. Fun fact that they entered in here was that a 1965 flare would cost nearly $3,000 in 2010 money. Which, uh, in 2024, which is when we're recording the episode, it's about $4,200. Yikes. Is that normal or above average for a kitchen range oven combo? Uh, so today, yeah, it's a little high. Uh, most good uh, ranges will cost you anywhere between 1000 or 1500 on the lower end to about 5,000 on the higher end. And then you have like really well-known things like True, the brand has ranges that are typically in the four, 5,000 plus. You have Viking, which are great, but also very expensive. Those are the kind of like uh, equipment that you would see in like a, like a restaurant type kitchen, uh, but they all make residential models and those are very pricey, but they look really nice. So uh, after 1965, it all pretty much goes downhill. The last series that was introduced of the flare was in 1968, where they came out with the N-series. 
they dropped the deluxe models and left only the 30 inch and 40 inch custom imperial units they didn't really the major improvements he listed don't really seem that major to me so they like the they moved the console light to the top and the they changed the drawer grip on the burner drawer 1968 was pretty much the end of the flare as the market shifted to self-clean ovens and high-low 30-inch ranges like the Twin 30 and the GE Americana, and 1971 was the last year that the flare was mentioned in any literature as a current model. Oh. R.I.P. I love, I love how they're like, the flare ends, we're going to switch to self-clean ovens. And meanwhile, my oven's from like the 1980s, and it is not a self-clean, and you have to clean it yourself, and it sucks. <laughs> One thing I didn't mention about the twin ovens is that the bottom oven was an exclusive Frigidaire pull and clean oven, which, so the whole inside of the oven, like its guts basically, like the four, the three walls, well, four, and then the back, slide out oh. of the inside of the oven. So it like, you can clean it easier because you're not actually like on the floor crawling into the oven. You can just like reach into it like it slides out like a little basket you can reach in that way to make it a little bit easier which is actually pretty cool but um, that's cool. apparently that's still more work than self-cleaning an oven which i suppose and that is the frigidaire flare awesome well now it's time i guess to, for us to go and remodel our kitchens <laughs> yes <laughs> hey but i was looking on on facebook marketplace and ebay and that kind of stuff and a frigidaire flare I get it. They're older. They're not real new ones, but they're in the thousand, five hundred to fifteen hundred range. That's so it. So you're looking, yeah. That's still cheaper than I was thinking. So maybe it's an achievable dream after all. Yep. But anyway, now that we're caught up to the present, that means it's time for our etiquette segment. So Gonzalo, what do we have today? I got the inspiration for today from an article. I read. Okay, I didn't read the article. I read the title of the article on the internet, <laughs> but. And I saw the images I had. Like, I skimmed through it to look at the images. <laughs> anyway, this article was about how smoking is not as common as it was in years past. Uh, apparently, only one in three Americans smoke cigarettes today compared to the one in five that smoked about 10 years ago, which means that throughout time, in the 1950s, when it peaked in 1954, 45% of adult Americans smoked. Through the 1970s and 80s, it went down to about 30, and today it is about 21%. So it's we're getting better. But our favorite book, uh, Amy Vanderbilt's Complete Book of Etiquette, A Guide to Gracious Living from 1957, has a section, or really a chapter, uh, on smoking etiquette. And it talks a lot about the differences between cigarettes, cigar, and pipe smoking. But in, uh, today what I wanted to talk about was... Um, a section that's called When Not to Smoke. And she says that it was so common in the 1950s that sometimes uh, they forget there are times and places where one should not smoke. And it kind of works today still. So the etiquette says uh, or talks about those taking part in religious ceremonies, be it at a home, a wedding, christening, or a funeral, should not smoke, just as you wouldn't smoke inside of a church. Uh, smoking in an elevator is a no-no. But it's not for the reason you would think. Like, whenever I started reading this, I thought it was because, you know, enclosed space and smoke. Mm -hmm. But Vanderbilt says that entering an elevator with a lit cigarette is, quote, threatening yourself or fellow passengers with possible burns if the elevator becomes crowded or there is an accident. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> yeah. I thought it was going to be, like, all secondhand smoke stuff. But no. It's like, no, no, don't take your cigarette into the elevator because you might accidentally burn someone with it. That's nice. Yeah, yeah, I guess, yeah, the secondhand smoke wasn't a, even a thing because so many people smoked back then. Yep. Just, there was smoke everywhere, but it's the fire on the end of the cigarette that is the problem in an enclosed space. Yes, which That's is something fair. we, I mean, I always, I never thought about, I mean, yes, I guess I did think about it, but like when people smoke around me, I'm never, my thought process is never, oh, you have a lit fire. <laughs> yeah, that's so funny. But yeah, you might think about that a little bit more in an elevator though, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> So she goes on to talk about smoking not being allowed in airplanes only when the non-smoking sign is on, but allowed when the pilot turns it off at altitude. However, we know now that it's never allowed in an airplane. And quick question, why do you think there's still ashtrays in the restrooms if we can't smoke in an airplane? 
because they never redesigned anything and everyone's lazy and no one designs anything anymore. And they designed one airplane bathroom in the 60s and decided they're done. <laughs> that's that's my theory. Oh, that's a good theory. I don't have an answer for you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's the official answer, but that's all I can think of is that they just keep <laughs> they just keep putting in the same bathroom in all new planes. Well, are people designing this is a tangent. Are people still designing planes? Yeah. Like, do they come out with new? I know, like, Virgin comes out with cool new stuff. Like, do you think they have ashtrays in their bathrooms? So, the airplane manufacturers come up with new models fairly regularly. And then what happens is when an airline places an order for an airplane, they can outfit it how they want. Oh. So, the real reason why we have, still airplanes have, um, ashtrays in their restrooms actually required by law. Uh, the FAA, which is the Federal Aviation Administration, has a requirement for, quote, the presence of an ashtray on or near the lavatory door to provide a convenient disposal location for cigarettes or other smoking material, and thereby ensures that there is a place to dispose of such material in the event that the no smoking policy is not adhered to. Oh, so, interesting. Yeah, which is kind of nice. I mean, you're not supposed to do it, right? So it's kind of like saying they're there for like, okay, so you are risking your legal life by doing this, but let's make sure that you don't also risk the actual lives of the people near you. Fair enough. But anyway, Vanderbilt goes on to talk about smoking at work, uh, which I thought is interesting. Uh, businesses may have different rules, which I don't know if you can smoke inside of offices now. She goes on to talk about the rules of an employee smoking. So if you are seated where they, meaning the employees, receive visitors, you should never smoke on the job. Hmm. Those are desks who are permitted to smoke should not allow the ashes or butts to pile up and instead dispose of them, not by dumping them loosely into the wastebasket. Cool. And lastly, there's nothing in Amy Vanderbilt's chapter on where a man should or shouldn't smoke. But she makes it a point to say that women should not smoke while walking on a city or town street. Although on an open country road, they may if they wish. What the heck? Huh. So what do you think about these? Should we keep um, them? I mean, yeah, I have mixed feels about smoking in general. Honestly, I thought everyone already quit smoking. And every time I see someone on the street smoking a cigarette, I'm like shocked. So... At the very least, I guess it's probably better to have an etiquette about it if you're gonna yeah. to make it so that you're not bothering other people as much as possible. But like, I honestly never minded and still to this day don't mind people smoking around me. Like, you know, they always say like secondhand smoke and stuff, but like to me, it never bugged me. And if anything, I've always enjoyed the smell of cigarettes, not like <laughs> me myself smoking them, but like. I've always enjoyed the smell of other people smoking cigarettes, and it's a really weird reason. But to me, it reminds me of back home. Because in Argentina, when I was growing up, like the smoking laws were much more lax. So I re vividly remember uh, getting off the plane at the airport after, you know, once we didn't live there anymore, we go back and visit. And the moment they opened the doors of the airplane and you walked into the airport, you could smell cigarettes. So to me, like it's like it's like a nice, cool memory. I mean, I never minded cigarettes. Yeah, smoker, that's so. the thing is, I don't mind it. I'm just like surprised. That's like I'm trying to like it. There are a couple bars around here where you can still smoke inside, and that is like a nice, comforting, old timey. Like this is what when you when you close your eyes and picture a bar. Yeah, like that's part of the bar experience. And I feel like they're just so rare to find those now. I'm just like always shocked when I see someone smoking a cigarette in public in like this year. I want everyone to be comfortable. <laughs> yeah, no, smokers. I hear you. But I do think, <laughs> I, I do like the idea that etiquette in the 1950s was pretty much saying like, okay, yeah, don't, don't smoke around people because you might inconvenience them, not from health reasons, but from fire reasons. Mm -hmm. um, and I love the idea that there were rules as to where or where you couldn't smoke inside of an office. Yeah, that is interesting. It's so. just, yeah, this I think so far of all of the etiquette rules we've covered is the hardest for me to picture and apply to now. Yeah. Because no one can smoke in their work indoors anymore. 
But it's actually really interesting to read that in 1957, there were etiquette rules, because mostly what this is making me realize is how much they ignored all of this in Mad Men, which is a, a bringing up again, because it is my, like, I'm constantly rewatching it. And it is the, the thing in the top of my brain whenever I think about the 60s. Mm-hmm. And Betty Draper smokes constantly in the streets, in restaurants. And apparently that was... Well, she's not following Vanderbilt's etiquette. Yeah, she's just not following the etiquette rules. And, like, they smoke in the office all the time. And everyone just had ashtrays on their desks and stuff. But I never see... They never show, like, a shot of them, like, emptying out their cigarette butts. So, like... But I'm guessing that... I don't know. Anyway, it's just interesting. So, I I don't really know how to approve or not approve these etiquette tips because they don't apply anymore. Yeah, I don't know if we can. I think this might be our first... uh, What's it called? Stalemate? Yeah. This is the first time that we have no real comment on uh, (laughs) Venable's etiquette. Yeah. But I guess if we're just going by, like, the message of it all, which is don't be a jerk. Yeah, that's probably good etiquette to follow. (laughs) Just, like, don't be rude. Yeah. Um, And Don't uh, burn people in the elevator. Yeah, don't burn people. Don't let your cigarette butts pile up because it's gross looking and stinky. And you want to keep a tidy appearance at all times. Yeah. Well, it looks like we've landed a plane. <laughs> uh, in which we did not smoke. Uh, so <laughs> thank you all for listening today. If you've enjoyed today's episode, please subscribe to the show and tell a friend. You can also follow us on Instagram at MCL Podcast. This is the best place to send us feedback and episode suggestions. So send us a DM anytime. Yep. Thanks for listening, guys. We'll talk to you again next week. Thank you for listening to Mid-Century Livy. Please subscribe, tell your friends, and leave a review. We are available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. You can also follow us on Instagram at MCL Podcast. See you next Friday.